I am really proud of myself to turn around time on this test. I am <laughs> looking at the grading. The NCAT questions are harder than my normal physics test questions. Mm -hmm. You guys probably picked that up. I didn't think they would be. I didn't think that the NCAT was going to be, you know, really significantly different. And so you probably also noticed that your score is not what it says on the paper, right? The um, the five lowest questions were questions. So essentially. I said, okay, I'm just going to make those five low scoring MCAT questions as extra credit. And I graded out of the number of points for the rest of them. And so, right, because actually I do think it's good experience to see those MCAT questions, but like I said, I was a little surprised. I thought the MCAT questions would be easier than my standard questions, not harder than the standard questions. Right. Uh, I don't think I got my rubric. You did not get one because I did not grade yours. Oh. Everyone else? Actually, not everyone else. There were, there were a couple other people. Mine also. Um, you're just great, but because of your score the final three, and I actually checked through yours and I was like, yeah, it's not going to make a difference, so I left it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so yeah, there are, there are a few people who didn't get, no, I don't think there's anyone who got one wrong in the last three, except for Ryan, who I didn't grade by hand. I think you're the only one that's in that category. There are some people who don't have the rubric because they got all three of the last three right. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? How is that possible? <laughs> there. Yeah. And there clearly was some guessing there. I was probably hand grading one person's. They, they got one right, but that one had no work on whatsoever. It was just guessed. And it totaled nine points when I added up the work from the other. So it, you got that. Divine intervention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just like, <laughs> okay, so, you know, I, 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 I'm a little sad about the MCAT questions because I thought that, like I said, I thought that those would be easier for you. And they did turn out that way. Um, what do you guys feel? I mean, Obviously, I could put more MCAT questions on and then discount them on future tests. Let's just have the MCAT. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is your feeling at this point about the MCAT questions? Should I keep them or should I not? Don't keep them. I think those extra credit. Yeah, maybe you just put them as like the extra credit questions at the end or something. You do extra credit, like put two of them that are specifically. I mean, I'm glad Lydia said just two, not you know. Like How many do I have on this? Like 10 MCAT questions? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Wes had something to say. Um, I just thought maybe, um, I know there's some things that definitely we could have known, but some things were that things that we just did, really didn't cover. So maybe just little things that you know, that we didn't cover, we'll, just throw that in as extra info. I'll, I'll come to you, DJ, but um, I thought I had covered all of those things. So uh, the, the one that I thought would be the trickiest one was the one about the base units. You know, we talked about the base units. I said that actually the Coulomb seems like it'd be a, a, a SI base unit, but it's not. It's the ampere. And so I was worried about that one, and that was, I think, the lowest score. But it is one that we talked about. Um, and I was actually pleased not one person missed the diamagnetism question. It had one statement that was clearly what I've said many times in class, and all the others. When I was reading it, I was like, gee, I don't know. I certainly never talked about that. But then there's one that was clearly what I said in class. Everybody picked up on that and yeah. got it right. Um, but, but what what else? That was just the one. That was me. Yeah. OK. Because yeah, we, we did talk about it. And I was a little concerned about it coming in. Because I mean, when I first read the question, I didn't notice that it said base units. And so I went with, well, the just take the units, newtons. Um, what was it? Newtons times meters per. Um, ampere, I, I don't know what it was. But I, I said, well, that's the right units, and then I noticed, oh, it says base units. And then if you looked at it, and that's why I put the comment that said they're all correct units. It's just knowing which ones are the base units was the point of that question. And, and that's the kind of thing that apparently they test in the MCAT. Now, these were, as I said on the test, I gave you the sites that I used for them. And it's a little appalling that the Khan Academy didn't have right answers for all of them. And I actually put one of them on there that Khan Academy had the wrong answer. 
they have the wrong answer, not because of bad physics, but because of not paying attention to the question. They answer a completely different question. And that, that was the one about the, the spectrometer. The, the Khan Academy's um, question there says, in terms of the velocity, what is the radius? And then it gets the radius in terms of an accelerating voltage. And if you look at their, their explanation, they said, you might have been tempted to put in this and gives the right answer. But that's in terms of the velocity, which is what it was asking about. <laughs> um, that, that made me a little concerned. Another one of theirs was just completely wrong. Okay, DJ, I have a question. Uh, well, this is more of a comment, really. I felt like we, we knew the material mm -hmm. for the MCAT stuff, uh, but the MCAT stuff also has an element of critical thinking to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the critical thinking is the stuff that we had like practiced beforehand. So just coming in with the stress on test day and doing the critical thinking like on the spot, I think is what makes them more difficult. It's like we have the material, but then it's also like, well, we have to apply it in a new light. B, I view it a little differently. I, I think most of the things we're doing require some critical thinking, but I thought that the way the questions were asked was often a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. Which is why I encourage people to ask me if they're confused about the question. Yeah. Which lets me get it twice. No one else asked me for a clarification. Congratulations, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, Lydia. Uh, just a, a question. For number 17, the mass spectrometer one, yes. didn't you do kind of a question like that in the practice test? Yeah. Or in the practice test? Uh, yeah, in the worksheets. In yeah. the worksheets, yeah. Because I recognize that one almost immediately from the worksheets, and I appreciate that because it made me feel like I knew what I was studying. I'm not yeah, that, and in fact, I didn't copy the verbiage from the MCAT question from Khan Academy on that one. I copied the verbiage from what I had put in the worksheet, but that was one of the questions they had in the Khan Academy, so. So maybe it would be worthwhile to put a couple of the MCAT ones maybe on the worksheet. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I yeah, no, that, that makes good sense. That makes good sense. I, I find the worksheet really helpful. I don't know if anybody else has yeah. them, but they give me a yeah. good direction. Oh, you're just studying. <laughs> Ryan's feeling a little good about himself right now. <laughs> but to, to, to give Lydia a little credit, to, you know, I think it makes it much easier. She asked me to put a word list. So on the one for chapter 24, I put a word list for the, the fill in the blank. So you know, oh, out of the 75 answers I could have given, this one here is the word list. That's the one. Um, Leslie, then DJ. So I, yeah, I agree with her about what the worksheet. I like it how you put like multi steps because then whenever we get like, I don't know, this for me that first synthesis question, even though it's not exactly what was on the worksheet, it was part of what we did. Mm -hmm. Something that that was awesome. So you can think about the steps. Yeah. DJ. Yeah, oh, and as as someone who is prepping to take the MCAT like <laughs> next month, yeah, and has been doing a lot of stuff like over oh, spring break about it. Um, it, it felt pretty familiar to what I have been practicing and stuff, and so... Now, one thing, I think that they do a lot more read this past than answer seven questions yeah. that related to it, and I can't really do that on the test. Yeah, so I... It's a mix. They have, like, passage-based, and then they have, like, discrete questions from, like, what you, what you know. And so a lot of times, like, if you have a question, you're like, well, am I supposed to use my knowledge, or am I supposed to use the passage? And you balance that out. Uh, but it's just good to see, I guess, mainly like the vernacular and like reasoning through the vernacular. It just felt similar to the test. Okay, that, that's true. Because I was looking at the vernacular, especially in the answers. I don't know who makes these answers, but there are also a lot of grammatical things like what? <laughs> yeah, I was looking at it as, as well as, you know, like it, it felt like it would feel reading it and looking at it on okay. the test. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it was less than 10 minutes. Any other discussion about the test? Hopefully everything's going good. You saw I graded, <laughs> I graded the first scrapbook during the test. I'll try to grade the second one soon instead of waiting till the next test. Sorry about that. Okay, we are going to finish with a couple fun things involving reflection ref refraction. So just a couple fun things, and then we're going to talk about optical instruments. So first... Oh, I wanted to open this web page. Uh, nope, it's not going to work. Um, refraction of light and Snell's law. Prisms. You know, when I was a kid, prisms were something my teacher had in the classroom. And if we finished the paper early, we could go play with the prisms. 
Hold on. All right, we're good. <laughs> Remember, headphones when you're watching the movie. I had them, I had them on before class, and someone's just talking to me. And like, I shook my laptop on, and they just started to get it. You know, it's okay. So we're good now. It's okay. I trust you're not, you know, wasting our class time though. Actually, watching. Yeah. Although I showed Nathan video clip yesterday of uh, ordering a pizza in class. Anyway, <clears throat> prisms. You know. Most of the kids in the class are like, ooh, that's a pretty rainbows. I was the one who was holding up my eyes and walking around and being funny because I have a different perspective on life apparently than most of my classmates. But prisms make pretty rainbows, and that is what we want to talk about here. Anybody have any idea what's going on with this link? Oh, 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 uh, uh, employed. Yeah, I'm actually going to pull it up because it's it's cool okay it's dark side of the moon album cover honestly i have never actually listened to this album at all so i know nothing about it or its lyrics but the album cover looks like that which is totally well it's totally cool except for one thing. It's got a flaw. Um, and this talks about how it came about. So here is a, uh, a picture of the inside and outside of the album cover. You have white light that goes into the prism, spreads out, and gives you a rainbow. The right-hand side, this is correct. What's incorrect about this side? Yeah, light works the same forward and backward. So I should be able to take the light here and it should look like a mirror image of that. Uh, this is a bigger prism, so it might be a little different, but here it's converging coming out, whereas there it's diverging. It should be diverging when it comes out. And just because we've talked about this, this is inside the album. What's that supposed to be? The green line is a heartbeat. And do you recognize the different parts of the normal sinus rhythm there? You've got the P wave when the atria contract is right there. And then you have the QRS complex, which is this region here. And then you have the T wave when you have the, what well, the QRS complex is the, the recovery of the atria at the same time that you're having generally the, the ventricles doing their pumping, so it's really not distinguishable. And then you have the recovery of the ventricles there. So it's, you know, it, it's kind of cool. And you know, like I said, I have no idea about the music in there. The only Pink Floyd song I've ever even known is, you know, Another Brick in the Wall, because as a young child, We Don't Need No Education really resonated with me. <laughs> How many of you are still resonating with that today? No hands. Well, that's good. So this is called dispersion. The prism is dispersing the light. Uh, dispersing, I mean, we understand that word. But in this context, dispersion is spreading out the light by the color. And so the key question is, how? How can a prism spread out light by color? I don't know if it says anything up here or not, but I'll give you the answer. You know that when light goes from one material to another, it bends. What do we call that bending? Refraction. Refraction. It refracts. And if it goes slower in the medium, it refracts more. And so the slower it is, the more it's going to refract. So if you look at this picture here, the light goes in, it has a single beam coming in. Which one is refracting the most? The violet. And in fact, this violet is... Well, I guess it's not coming normal, so it's okay. It can't refract farther than going normal, right? So the violet is refracting the most. What does that tell you about the speed of violet light? Fastest? Oh, slowest. slowest. The violet is, the, because we're coming from air, air is the fastest we can have. So the closest to straight is going to be the fastest. So violet has a slower speed in the glass, and red has a faster speed in the glass. And so we call this a dispersion relation, the difference in speeds. 
And so we had more refraction for violet coming in and more refraction for violet coming out. That's why it should be diverging like it showed on the right side of the album. And here we have the colors of the rainbow, good old Roy G. Biv. And I will always just use blue as the end of the spectrum. Violet should be what I use probably, but I have a hard time distinguishing the difference because your acuity of vision is really dropping off when you get down into the violet. And so it's hard, to, hard for me at least to tell the difference in those colors. Unless stuff like this, or the screen. <laughs> I forget I'm using a different app, one that I can draw better in. Here's a question. I haven't asked you this yet, have I? Why is the sky blue? We have a lot of different answers that people give. There's some truth to two of them, but only one is correct. But a lot of people get this wrong. Now, each one of these statements is, in fact, a true statement, but only one truly explains why the sky is blue. So go ahead and offer up opinions. I want people to, to actually say, I know that probably most of you are going to be wrong. That's not the issue here. Okay, reflection from water on earth. Anyone else? I guess it's Michael. I was <laughs> You're going with B? D. D. D is in dog. Mira says B. What'd you say? Instead of trying to decide whether I should go B or D. Try to decide between B and D? Yes. <laughs> You're going to disappear, Ryan? How are you? Thanks for going to get through life. C. You can just be. Okay, Nathan says C because no one said C. Now, all of these things are true things. Water does reflect, or light does reflect from the water on Earth, right? Very clear. But that is not why the sky is blue. Water in the atmosphere absorbs more red than blue. That's absolutely correct. That is, I think, the primary reason why glacial ice has this beautiful blue color is because of the absorption. But that is not why the sky is blue. Me scattering is uniform for all colors. Absolutely true, but how would that make the sky blue? Me scattering is why clouds are white. Because you have the essentially white light that gets scattered in all different directions equally. That's what the uniform is. And so clouds look white unless they're so thick that you have light doesn't get through and then they look darker. So the correct answer is the one that we had the most people going with. Rayleigh scattering is strength is proportional to what does it mean if I put lambda to the minus one fourth? It's one over wavelength to the fourth power. So the Rayleigh scattering is, is proportional strength to one over wavelength to the fourth power. So shorter wavelengths are going to have much stronger scattering. Longer wavelengths will have much weaker scattering. Now, what is Rayleigh scattering? Kind of an important question for this discussion. Now, this is not something that you talk about a lot in life, but you notice the sky is blue, so that's why I like to talk about it. Things, things I love about physics are that I can explain things like this, why the sky is blue. And so Rayleigh scattering is when light waves come to molecules that are smaller than the wavelength of light. So remember, wavelength of light is 400 to 750 nanometers. So it has to be molecules or scattering centers, as we call them, that are smaller than that. And in that case, their interaction is described by Rayleigh. And you basically have the light is absorbed and re-emitted. And that happens much more for short wavelengths than for long wavelengths. So the sun is producing essentially white light. But when that light hits molecules in the atmosphere, a lot of the blue light gets scattered out in all different directions. And so if you take white light and you take away blue, what color results? All the rest of them. But if you take away blue, it takes on a yellow hue. And so the sun looks a lot more yellow than it really is because the atmosphere is taking the blue away. But if you look anywhere that's not at the sun, the light you're seeing is like it was scattered from the sun. The sunlight went over there, scattered off of things, and now it's coming to me. So I'm only seeing scattered light if I look away from the sun. 
And since blue is much more scattered than red, that's why I see the sky is blue. So then what about sunsets? So what about sunsets? Very good question. When you have a sunset, the sun is on the horizon. And so the light from the sun is coming through a lot more atmosphere. And what's the atmosphere doing to the light from the sun? Um, it's, it's scattering away which color? Blue. Blue. So it's scattering away the blue. And of course, it's not just blue, it's just more blue than anything else. And so you're scattering away the colors on the blue side of the spectrum, leaving the colors on the red side of the spectrum. So the sun looks much more red at sunset than it does when it's up in the sky because of the increased length of atmosphere the light has to go through. And you have all of that red light getting to you, which makes other things look red as well because it's mostly red light getting to you. So you have a cloud, the sun hits it, it looks pinkish. Okay, first hand was mirror. Don't Look at all the hands on this side. Don't pollutants in the sky also create a change in the scattering? So yes, they do. <laughs> okay, you guys can laugh at me at this, but when I started college, we moved to Southern California. My dad took a job working for a local university, Los Angeles campus. And one night, the moon was red. And I, being raised as Seventh-day Adventist, knew that this was a sign of the end. I was a little perturbed. I did not realize that Southern California with its really bad pollution problem back then, that that was just the smog. And so yes, it does. It provides a lot more scouting and probably there's some absorption in that pollution as well. Your question. Oh, did you have your Tracy too, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, by scattering, because I know there's like a, a, absorbing going on and mm -hmm. all that stuff, but what, what exactly do you mean by scattering? Because when I think okay. scattering, I think that it, that's what's being emitted. So, so that's why I'm, that's... Good question. Scattering is the word we use. It's the same thing if you're playing cue <coughs> ball. Yes, that's what we call it. Pool. If you're playing pool, you hit the balls and the balls bounce off each other. That's what we call scattering in physics. So we always start scattering problems by doing a pool problem in a physics class. And then we go to now we have other kinds of scattering, but it's it's bouncing off of something. And so we have these little wallet water droplets. It's not technically bouncing when the light scatters, but it looks like that. So, so that's why in astronomy they'll talk about reflection nebula. Mm -hmm. A reflection nebula is actually scattered light. It's rainy scattering going on in the light. So the thing that's being scattered, um, is that the color we're seeing, or is that some, just something else? That's it's like the light that's being scattered that you see when you look at the sky anywhere else yeah. than the sun. Okay. Okay, Chris. So I get, you know, you, it makes sense why the sun looks yellow to orange or red. And I know that the light we see on the moon is coming from the sun. Yeah. So why doesn't the moon look the same? Why doesn't the moon look the same color? Yeah. It's a really good question. Um, my best, well, no, that's not a good answer. I, I, frankly, I'm not sure why. Because the moon should also be yellowed in the same fashion. So I'm not sure why. It's a good question. We still have to look it up. Any other questions? We are going at super fast speed today's lecture. <laughs> also, I keep forgetting I'll swipe down in this one. So the question about absorption by water. Here is an absorption spectrum of water. What this is showing is the higher it is, the more it's absorbed. So this is very absorbing. So this is ultraviolet light here. Water absorbs very heavily in the ultraviolet. Notice this is um, logarithmic. So this here is 200 nanometers. Basically beyond 200 nanometers, the water is absorbing. Anything shorter than 200 nanometers, it absorbs. And then you get to the visible spectrum. The, the water is absorbing, you know, 0.01 in the red and only 0 0.0001 in the blue. So the water is absorbing, if you think about it, 100 times more red than it is blue. So it is a significant factor, but not for why the sky is blue. This would be playing into why water looks blue. Right? You have sunlight that comes into the water and it's absorbing red, so you have blue light that's getting through, reflecting back to you. So, wanted to show you that, so you don't, so you don't think, oh no, 
everything's because of Rayleigh scattering. There's also that effect. Ah, I've got the <laughs> next one. Rainbows. My first or second year as a teacher, I only talked about first order rainbows. And then they had a second order rainbow question on the MCAT. And I felt so ashamed that I hadn't covered second order rainbows. So we will talk about both orders of rainbows. You can see the picture on the right shows both. And the next page shows more about the second order. But rainbows, we all observe pretty rainbows. The Bible says, I do put my bow in the sky. There will be a sign between me and you that I shall not set in another flood or something like that. I probably paraphrased by the time we got to the end. Probably because it's Millie. So what causes a rainbow? There are those people who will say that every time there's a rainbow, God made it because, you know, that statement. There are others, like me, who say God made the laws of physics. And the laws of physics is why we have rainbows. And God's statement, there must have been no rainbows, if we're going to take Bible literally here, were rainbows before must mean that there were different conditions for moisture in the atmosphere so that they didn't occur. Because as we understand rainbows, we can explain them very well with physics. A rainbow occurs when light goes into a water droplet, reflects, and comes back out. And so the first order rainbow is shown with this geometry here. Light comes into the rainbow, comes into the front surface. So here's light coming in, goes into the front surface, and it refracts. Duh. It refracts because it's going slower in the water. But water, just like glass, is a dispersive medium. So here's the index of refraction as a function of wavelength. And you see that there's, obviously, Segelstein's is a theoretical curve because it's nice and smooth, whereas Lynch and Livingston and the IAPWS 5C, well, the IAPWS is, is a smooth fit, basically, to Lynch and Livingston's experiment of showing what the indices of refraction are in water for different colors. But what you see is water is a dispersive medium. Now, how much different? You know, 1.333 about there and 1.35 there. It's not a big difference, but it's enough that you do have light that goes into the water will be dispersed. So different colors will refract by different amounts. So you have white sunlight coming in. White means you have all of the different colors of the spectrum. And then you have, just like with the glass, the violet is going to be refracted the most and the red is refracted the least. And then you get to the back and you have a reflection. Now, if you look at this, you're likely to say, well, you know, I think there's going to be some light that comes out here as well. Sure, there will be. It's not all of the light that's reflected. If it was all the light reflected on the back, rainbows would be super bright. Some of it is reflected, some of it goes on, but the rainbow is only constructed from the reflected, so that's why we only show the reflected here. Now, here's the interesting thing. That's as zoomed in as it'll get. The violet crosses the red right there. One's coming in, one's coming out. And then they reflect, and they come and they cross again here. So the violet was below the red when it came in, but now it's coming in above the red or coming out above the red. And so when they come out, there are different angles. And I'm going to really exaggerate these angles for effect. So the red is going like this and the violet. How could I miss the pen? The violet is going like this. So they're coming out at different angles. And that's really the key for why we get rainbows because the light that comes in is dispersed and comes out of the water droplet with a different angle for a different color. And so we look in the sky and we have the sun over there and we have the water cloud over here. So the sun light to water cloud gives me a direction and then it comes back and it's 40 degrees versus 42 degrees for the two colors. So the one that is coming out flatter, I'm gonna to have to look lower in the sky to see that flatter angle. The one that's coming out at a steeper angle, I'm going to have to look higher in the sky. So when I look at this, I'm going to have the violet down lower and the red up higher when I'm looking at where the light is coming from. Because if I look too high for, you know, too high, it's just passing below. 
And so that's why the colors are seen as different locations is because it has to be coming from the same or from a different position to have the right angle. There's a question over here someone had. Leslie. So I noticed that sometimes some rainbows are brighter and brighter than others. Some of them you can barely see them. Some mm -hmm. of them were like, well, there it is, you know? So I was wondering if that had to do at all with the amount that is actually reflected when it's in the water droplet or? Not, not the percentage reflected. It has more to do, I believe, with the size of the droplets and the density of the droplets. Because you're actually the percentage will be fine. But if you have more droplets, you have more light to be reflected. Like I said, the size also should make a difference. So this picture here shows the gentleman looking at the first order rainbow. And you see that we have three colors, the violet, the green, and the red coming from each droplet. But when he's looking at the lowest droplet, he's only seeing the one that's coming out flattest. When he's looking at the upper one, he's only seeing the light that's coming out the steepest. And of course, in the middle, he sees the middle color. So can you see how, why we see a rainbow spread out in space when each droplet is spreading out the colors at different angles? Now here's a second order bow. It has a fundamental difference. What's the fundamental difference? Location of exit. Okay. A fundamental outcome is different angles for exit. But what I see is the most significant difference is this is two reflections instead of one reflection. So the first order rainbow is one reflection. The second order rainbow is two reflections. And following each reflection, you're going to have the light spread out. And this, this does not show it, but you're going to have the light cross over. And so in this second order bow, the order is actually reversed. The violet is the steepest and the red is the, the flattest, if you will. And, and that's what DJ saw as the, the significant thing. So the second order bow, two reflections. The second reflection is reversing the direction of the colors. And so when you look at a rainbow, let's go to the next one. Oh, well, this here is showing those angles, 40 and 42 degrees, between the incident light and the reflected light. So it's very fixed. A rainbow is a circular arc because if you're looking at the inside of the rainbow, you're going to be looking at a circle that is 40 degrees between the sunlight hitting that water droplet and then coming back to you. So that's why it forms a rainbow or a circle because of that. So at the center of the circle, you should have the shadow of your head because that would be the line going straight <laughs> from the sun through your head to the center of the rainbow. So you can always determine where the sun is from a rainbow. If you see a rainbow, find where the center of the rainbow is and then directly opposite that's where the sun is. Which is why you never see a full rainbow if you're standing on Earth in a flat region like Nebraska. Because the sun is always going to be somewhere above you, and so you would have to look down to the dirt to see part of the rainbow. Now, if you are in special situations close to sunset and you're standing on a cliff, sometimes you might see a full rainbow. Or if you're in an airplane, you can see a full rainbow. But you're not going to see it standing on Earth. So here's a rainbow, and you see the violet, blue, yellow, well, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Somewhere along the line, you have Roy G. Biff spelled out. Indigo is in there somewhere. Indigo is between violet and blue. Um, do you notice the difference between this region and this region? Yeah, lighter and darker. This region here is actually has a name, Alexander's Dark Band. And my teacher in graduate school is very funny, you know, not to be confused with Alexander's Ragtime Band. It's a completely different band. Alexander's Dark Band is that region between the first order bow and the second order bow. This you can see the background, this you can't. Now talking about the light, what do you suppose makes it so I can't see the background here? <clears throat> That's where all the, the light that's being reflected is kind of meeting up. 
Well, I, this is where I'm seeing a lot of scattered light. It's white, so I don't see any specific color scattering, I just see a lot of scattered light. In this region here, all of the scattered light is not coming toward me, it's being scattered away from me. And so I can see right through it because the light's not being coming back to obscure the light that was coming from beyond it. And so that's why there's the difference in those bands. It's how much scattered light is coming from the water droplets. Trace. So does that mean that you will, I don't sound good, but you on the other side of the rainbow, mm -hmm. those people boost? Um, like would the light side be dope and the dope side be light? I don't think you'd observe anything special there, but... You said, you said it's going away from Yeah, no, I, I, I know what you're saying makes sense. What you're saying makes sense, but I don't think you would observe something like that. I, it's a really good question. It's like your second good question of today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Doing my best. Okay, so here's, here's a picture that shows the inside the rainbow, the first order bow, the Alexander's dark band, and the second order bow. And I understand you can get higher order bows in special situations. I have never observed one. My, Mira. So is there not a name for the lower part of it? It's just the I think it's dark band on the top, but the on the bottom. As far as I know, yes. And it's this looks like you're seeing a lot here, but if you compare the two, you are seeing more background here. It's that picture is a little deceiving in that way. So would it be darker behind the second order? Or I guess above the second order? Yeah. Um, I haven't actually studied what's going on there. It's, you, you have light starting to be scattered in all directions just about evenly, so it starts to become not really much different, I think. <laughs> but we're moving beyond what I've studied, too. You guys are you're asking good questions, and, and yeah, I try to know as much as I can. So the first order rainbow comes between 40 and 42 degrees. The second order rainbow between 52 and 54 and a half degrees. So if a rainbow looks smaller, that means that it's coming from something closer to you. Okay. What color is on the inside of the first order rainbow? Let's see. We have C. Why would it be C? And not asking you to go from because I know the order in a rainbow. Yeah. Do the other try first. Hmm? Then we'll wait. Or last. Because the, the blue or violet is a smaller angle than the sun. And so it's coming out more horizontally, so you're going to have to look down lower to see that. The red is a steeper angle, so you're going to have to look up higher to see it. All right, we've got 10 minutes for optical instruments. Optical instruments, okay, our eyeglasses are optical instruments. But on this chapter, we're going to focus first on simple magnifiers, things we say, oh, that's too small for me to read. Let me, uh, yes, now I can read it. Yes. Those, I instantly moved it away when I took this away. When I'm reading with this, I bring it up close. I can't focus at this distance. It's all blurry, so I took it back. I can focus at that distance. Why is it easier to read with this bringing it up close? Have you ever thought about it? Because of the way it's bending. The, the, obviously, it has to have something to do with the way it's bending. Not the answer I was looking for, but it must have something to do with the way it's bending. Well, we start with, well, this is just the question I ask, okay? We determine something's size by the angle it makes in our eye. So when I hold this out here, it makes an angle that's, you know, that big. If I bring it closer, it's a bigger angle. And so a bigger angle is bigger. Our brain says that's bigger. So if you don't have reference points, when the moon is up in the middle of the sky, you tend to think it looks smaller. But when it's down on the horizon, you have reference points, then you're like, ooh, the moon's big. And so there is a very real phenomenon where people think that the moon gets larger on the horizon. It's not actually getting larger, it's that we have things to give a reference for. 
And so you might have been to some place where they have little optical illusions where there's a room that has like a checkerboard painted on the floor. And one side of the room is small and one side is big. The checkerboards are graded in size. And so your brain tells you that when somebody walks over there, they're really big. When somebody walks over here, they're really small. And so you can have two people that are you know, very different height, like a child and a parent. And you can have one walk here, one here, and you say, ooh, the child is much bigger than the parent. You guys observe that? It's because the way our brain perceives size, and we have that angle, but we use other cues for reference. If we don't have those cues, all we have is the angle for size. And so what we're focusing on here is that angle for size. Because if I want to see fine detail, I'm not worried about the cues, I'm, looking at, I'm worried about how big is the angle so I can see it. So when we're talking about magnification, magnification is going to, magnification is just the ratio of the angle it would have made with our eye if we just looked at it normally to the angle it makes with our eye if I use something like my simple magnifier. So in this case, okay, ringing the remote again, I could bring it up to here. Oh boy, my vision not so good today, huh? Yeah, you can only get it out here and it's in focus. And it's about a millimeter tall letters. And so the angle is a really small angle. With this, I can bring it up to here. It's the same size letter, but it looks much bigger because it's making a bigger angle in my eye. That's the point of a magnifier. Basically, you can bring it closer. So somewhere here I have the angle magnification equation. There it is. The definition for our angle magnification is the angle that it makes aided, so that would be like when I use the magnifier, to the angle it makes unaided. Now notice I can move things around. So the angle it makes unaided is just going to be at the closest position I can put it where it's in focus. I'm going to take that angle as the unaided angle. Question, so Trace. The angle that's aided yeah. as you go over magnification, is it a wider or narrow? It's a bigger angle. Right, when I brought that closer, the height was bigger, or, or excuse me, the height was the same, but it was closer, so that makes a bigger angle. And actually, there was a picture here. This picture here was to illustrate that. When it's, you know, it's the same size object, but when it's closer, it's a bigger angle. Yeah. And to clarify, there's only one spot in space where it's going to be in focus. Um, if we did not have folks in the building, that would be true. And we're going to, well, probably not today, because you saw how much time I spent already. But we're going to get to that. We will talk about the difference in accommodated and unaccommodated viewing. Accommodated is when your eye is straining a little to focus on something closer. Unaccommodated is when your eye is completely relaxed. And we usually use our optical instruments for unaccommodated viewing because then our eyes can be relaxed and we don't suffer eye strain over time. You know, it makes a difference in the magnification, but it's a small difference. Okay, so... <clears throat> After all this discussion, just to make sure you've, you know, been here in class while I've been talking, what do you naturally do when you want to see something in greater detail? See. See. Yes, you want to see. And increase the ambient light. That is a good answer. <laughs> well, Blinking is something we do, right? I mean, it's, it's a natural response to try, to try to get that vision clear. And increasing the ambient light, that definitely does help us, especially, I mean, some situations more than others. But when it's dark, I don't see very well. And moving it closer to the eye. The one I wanted you to answer was move it closer to the eye, but these other answers are not bad answers. <laughs> okay, B is a bad answer. You're right, B is a very bad answer. And so ND is a very bad, bad answer. Okay, so. Stop. Stop. Yeah, let the eye dry out. You know, maybe that'll help. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about the simple magnifier. The simple magnifier is what I've been demonstrating here. A single lens that we use to magnify. So... <clears throat> Which kind of lens do you suppose I've been using for this simple magnifier? Converging or diverging? Converging is the correct answer. That is, it's thicker in the center, thinner at the edges, it has a convex nature. Why am I doing that? Well, let's just <laughs> look at this picture. If I have 
an object and the object is small, if I use this, I can bring this closer and it makes an image that's a virtual image out there. Now, if I make it farther away, what kind of image is this going to make? If I have a converging lens and I'm farther than one focal length away, what kind of image does it make? If it's farther than one focal length, then it's going to make a real. If it's closer than one focal length, it's going to make a virtual. I really need a virtual image. I really need a virtual image because I have the image on that side of my head, not on this side of my head. And so a virtual image is on the same side as the object or a lens. Remember, for a mirror, it was just the opposite because a mirror, the light reflects off instead of going through. That's what reverses that. So I need to make a virtual image that's larger. Now, if I put this one focal length away, where's the image going to be? Okay. One focal length away, it's going to make it using the thin lens equation. Let's just do the thin lens equation. If, okay, so thin lens equation was 1 over focal length is equal to 1 over distance object plus 1 over distance image. So let's say distance object equals focal length. So I just substituted in distance object as focal length. Well, if I subtract 1 over focal length, I get 0 is equal to 1 over distance image. Or distance image equals 1 over 0. Where's the image? OK, undefined. It's infinitely far away. Right, 1 over 0. If you approach 1 over 0, you approach infinity. So that makes an image infinitely far away. Now, how far should my eye be able to focus if I have good eyes, standard vision? Infinity. Infinity. And so if I put the object one focal length away, it's going to make an image infinitely far away. And my eyeball will just relax viewing views infinitely far away. To view anything closer, we have to, to change that crystalline lens. And so relax viewing, I put the object in focal length, the image is infinitely far away. So we're going to use that to calculate the magnification we get from a simple magnifier. <clears throat> so first, what's the angle if I don't use the magnifier? If I don't use the magnifier, what's the closest distance I can bring it to me by definition of name? What's the name for the closest point where I can focus on it? I know, it's been before spring break. In lab, you had to measure this. It's called the near point. The near point is the closest point where you can focus. So if I want to see something, you know, as, as clearly as I can, make the biggest angle, I bring this up till it's at my near point. I say, okay, now what's that angle? First things first. That's going to be a small angle if it's something small that I'm trying to read. And so we're going to use the small angle approximation. Small angle approximations, sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Cosine theta is approximately equal to 1. So tangent theta is approximately equal to, well, tangent theta is exactly equal to sine theta over cosine theta. So that makes it approximately equal to theta over 1, or theta. So this is the small angle approximations. Now, the units you have to use here are radians for the angle. So in units of radians, tangent theta is just equal to theta if it's a small angle. So when I look here, I'm looking for what is this angle theta unaided. The opposite side is the height of my object. The adjacent side is my near point distance. And so tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, and we said that's approximately equal to theta because of the small angle approximation. So that is the unaided angle that I can see here.
And so I should put here theta unaided. Did you have a question, Leslie? Yeah, I was just wondering, so then when we do calculations for this, do you want us to be in raising? Um, for this calculation, definitely. Although they're going to cancel out. <laughs> it just, it, you'd have a conversion factor if you were in degrees. Now, let's say I use my lens and I put the object so it's at the focal length. If the object's at the focal length, my image is at infinity, and now tangent theta is equal to, I still have this triangle here. Height is the opposite side. Focal length is the adjacent side. And that's approximately equal to theta aided. So the magnification, what was the definition of magnification here? Angular magnification. Right. So H over F was the aided. H over N was the unaided. Well, H over F over H over N, clearly we have some canceling we can do. And we have M equals N over F. So that's the magnification we get from a simple magnifier with unaccommodated viewing, where I have the object at the focal length so my eyeball can relax. Next class period, I'll talk about the accommodated viewing, how we calculate that. All right. Have a great day. I'll see you all again on Friday.